Hi there. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, whether you're watching this webinar live or whether you're watching the recording, it's lovely to have you here with More to Life. Um, tonight, we are extremely lucky. We are joined by Jessica Hepburn. Hi, Jessica. Hello, here I am. Um, Jessica is one of the leading voices on fertility and infertility um, and is also the founder of Fertility Te uh, Fest. She has um, written two books, one called The Pursuit of Motherhood and the other one called 21 Miles and they really are a great read. I would recommend them to you. Now before I pass you over to Jessica, there's just a couple of things I have to tell you. If you hover your cursor over the bottom of your screen, you'll see that there's a Q&A function down at the bottom. Um, we welcome you to use that. We won't answer your questions as we go. What we will do is we will let Jessica finish her presentation and then we'll come back and have a look at your questions and we'll try to answer as many as we can. Now, Jessica tonight is going to talk to us about whether or not motherhood makes you happy. So I'm going to hand you over to Jessica. It just takes me a minute to sort myself out. And um, Jessica will try to answer that question for you. Have fun, Jessica. Thank you. See you soon, Heather. Bye. Hello, webinar people. This is the first time I've ever done a, we a live webinar. It's very exciting, but a teeny bit nerve-wracking that the technology is going to behave. So, as Heather said, I'm going to be talking about the central question in my new book, Does Motherhood Make You Happy? I do get that doing that on a platform called There's More to Life Than Children is maybe a bit ironic. But bear with me, come on this journey over the next 30 minutes or so. Because if you're listening to this, I figure that at some point in your life, you maybe thought there wasn't more to life than having children. That maybe, like me, you thought you could never be happy if you weren't a mother or a father. Hello to any men that are out there listening too. So my book, 21 Miles, there she is, um, is actually about many things. It's about me, it's about motherhood, it's about food, and it's about swimming. Well, not just swimming a few laps in the pool, it's about swimming the English Channel, one of the hardest physical and mental endurance feats on the planet. Do you know what the most asked question I get about swimming the English Channel is? Well, it's, do you cover yourself in goose fat? And the answer is no. They did do in the old days until they realized that it doesn't actually keep you warm. Nothing keeps you warm but swimming and a bit of human padding, which is why my book is also about food. Training to swim the channel is a license to eat. It's the best bit about it. In a nutshell, 21 Miles is the story of how I wrote to 21 inspirational women and asked them to meet and eat with me, to help me get fat, to swim the channel, and to ask, answer the question, does motherhood make you happy? So, I should just probably give you a bit of backstory before we go on. I love the bit in Jodie Day's book, who's the founder of Gateway Women and is also in my book. This is the original version of her book, which is called Living the Life Unexpected. I love the bit when she says that there are 50 ways not to be a mother. It's a spin on the Paul Simon track, 50 ways to leave your lover. We all have a different story, and this is mine. I was 34 when I first started trying for a baby. I thought it was the perfect age. I'd done everything that women of my generation were told to do. I'd been to university, I'd climbed the career ladder, I'd been picky 
about choosing a partner who would be my emotional and intellectual equal. Back then, I'd recently been made chief executive of the Lyric Hammersmith Theatre in London. If you don't know the Lyric, I thought I'd show you a picture of her. Ooh. Right, we have to go back to the beginning. <laughs> That's my first picture. I thought I'd show you a picture of her. There she is. Um, at the time, I was the youngest woman to have led one of London's largest theatres. And you know what? I thought I could have it all. And maybe I could have done if everything had gone to plan. But after around a year of trying to conceive naturally, my partner and I were diagnosed with unexplained infertility. Which, let's be honest, is a terrible diagnosis because it isn't really one at all. It was the start of what would become a decade long struggle to conceive that involved a total of 11 rounds of IVF, multiple miscarriages and an ectopic pregnancy that was only discovered at three months. A perfect baby, but in the wrong place. Not in my womb, but in my stomach. For years, like many people struggling with infertility, I didn't tell anyone what I was going through. Not even my closest family and friends, let alone colleagues or strangers. The thought of doing a webinar on the subject, total anathema. Publicly, I was a successful career woman, but privately, I was on a desperate mission to become a mother. I think my silence was due to a complex mix of things. Shame that I couldn't do what so many other women found so easy to do. Hope that next month the nightmare would be over and I'd be able to join the mummy club too. And perhaps also concern that after women had fought so hard for so long to be seen as more than wives and mothers, that it was somehow a portrayal to admit that my brilliant career just wasn't enough on its own. In fact, my deepest fear was that I could never be happy if I couldn't have my own children. I started writing about my pursuit of motherhood just after my 40th birthday. I'd never written anything before, but I started to write the book I wanted to read. Because at the time, I couldn't find it. I also thought it had the makings of a good story full of narrative highs and lows. And I genuinely thought when I started writing that I'd write my way to a conventional miracle happy ending. It was a big decision to publish the book. In the wider world, I was no one, but in my small theatre world, I was someone. And I didn't want anyone to know the full horror of it. The depths of desperation and despair I'd been taken to. And if you ever read either of my books, which I hope you do, you'll know that my writing is brutally honest. I considered publishing it under a pseudonym. I was going to call myself Jessica Harper. Harper is my grandmother's maiden name. And then my editor did a Google search and saw that there was a Jessica Harper who defrauded Lloyds Bank of a million pounds and it wasn't worth the mix up. But the thing that really helped me to decide was that I knew that there were some things that I wanted to see changed in the world around fertility, infertility and, and the IVF industry. And I could only really do that if I was me. So my first book, The Pursuit of Motherhood, here's my first book, there she is, was published four years ago. And it catapulted me into the limelight as one of the few people at the time prepared to talk openly about the stigma of infertility. Having been so private for so long, now my life is everywhere. 
I'm even doing a webinar. For my sins, I've even been in the Daily Mail. Going back to my presentation now. There you go. Can you imagine waking up to that headline, addicted to IVF, Jessica's craving for a baby cost her 50,000 pounds and drove her to the brink of insanity and very nearly killed her? Great. Um, there's even a chapter in my new book that looks at that story and that day. Well, suffice to say, what's happened since my first book was published is my life has changed completely. Not only have I written a second book, but I've become a fertility campaigner and founded an organization that brings together my arts background with my fertility experience. It's called Fertility Fest. Here it is. It's the world's first arts festival dedicated to fertility, infertility, modern families, and the science of making babies. And our aims are threefold. One, to improve fertility education, so young people um, in school can learn how more than how not to get pregnant, so that they have the best chance of creating the families they want in the future, with or without children, with or without reproductive science. Secondly, to enhance understanding of what it means to struggle or go on a complex journey to conceive so that we can create better outcomes for everyone, whatever their fertility story, however it ends. And thirdly, to raise all levels of discourse about fertility, infertility and reproductive science. We've just announced that the third edition of the festival will be going to the Barbican Centre in London next year. Check out the website for details. And maybe in the new year, if Heather allows me, I can come back and talk to you more about Fertility Fest. So, 21 miles. Swimming in search of the answer to the question, does motherhood make you happy? How did that happen? Well, the last ch chapter of my first book was called 601 Days. This was based on the fact that there were 601 days from when I wrote it until I was going to be 43 years old. And basically, my mantra in life was that it was all about the number 43. If I hadn't had a baby by then, I could get on with the rest of my life. Except I didn't ever really think that was going to come to pass. I thought I was going to have a baby by the time I was 43. But the beginning of my new book starts with me turning 43, no baby. And I just thought I would read you a very short passage that might resonate. Here we are. 43 is a prime number. It has its own Wikipedia page. It is also a centre heptagonal, a hegena, and a reap digit. 43 is the atomic number for technatium, a silvery grey metal. It is the international dialing code for Austria, the name of a Spanish liqueur, and the number of the bus route that goes from Barnet to London Bridge. Now I am 43, and like all prime numbers, I seem to be divisible by only one, and that one is me. Like I said, nature is not a feminist. And maybe that's why the number of women entering their 40s childless has doubled in a generation. If these women are anything like me, it's not necessarily because they've actively chosen not to have children. Many of them probably assumed they would be mothers too. And now they're left wondering what the hell they're gonna do. I wonder if that's any of you. So there I was, 43, and I decided I needed to do something completely different with my life, something big. And so I embarked on what was essentially a childhood dream turned midlife crisis. I decided I would swim 21 miles from England to France across the English Channel to raise money and awareness for families without children and children without families. Because you know, for those of us who are childless, we have a lot in common with children in care. We both hate Christmas, for example. 
But the thing is, when I set out on this new journey, I had no idea what was involved. I'm not a swimmer. When I started, I'd never done anything more than a few laps of breaststroke in the local pool. In fact, I hate exercise and the cold. I didn't know you can't wear a wetsuit if you want to be an official channel swimmer because Captain Matthew Webb, I'm going to show you a picture of him now. There he is. The man with the, uh, that, uh, the, man with the walrus moustache who was immortalised on a box of matches who was the first man to swim the channel in 1875 didn't wear a wetsuit. I told you the gooseback question, but other questions that people ask me about swimming the channel are, can you get out of the water for a rest? No. Can you at least stop and float for a bit? Well, yes, but you don't want to do that because you'll just get colder and every moment you stop is another moment you've got to swim. And how long does it take? Well, on average, around 15 hours. The longest ever swim was 28 hours. 44 minutes. But the one redeeming thing I learned about swimming the channel is that aspiring channel swimmers get to eat a lot. As I said, it's the only way to keep out the cold. And this led to an idea, which was what if I wrote to a range of famous women and asked if they would meet and eat with me to help me get fat to swim the channel? And answer the question, does motherhood make you happy? After 11 rounds of unsuccessful IVF, did I need to find an alternative route to parenthood, like adoption, fostering, embryo donation, surrogacy, or could I have a fulfilling life without children? And 21 Miles is the story of that journey. Amazingly, the people I wrote to said yes, from professors to baronesses, award winners, to record breakers, um, household names, to people who have done something quietly amazing. I met with 21 women, some mothers, some not, all of them with fascinating and compelling truths to tell about life fulfillment and the meaning of motherhood. I ate a lot of cake. But let me tell you that one woman that I met with, Prue Lee, the new queen, great queen of the Great British Bake Off, didn't eat cake. She only ate a peach, but it was a very good looking peach. Prue is the mother of one biological child and one adopted child, and we had a fascinating conversation around that. Anyone who is childless out there who has had to face that dreaded question, why don't you just adopt, will appreciate Prue's comments about there being no just about it. I took a selfie with each of the women I met, and here are some of the others. On the left, the MP Fiona McTaggart, who went through six rounds of unsuccessful IVF before being diagnosed at the end of all that, at the age of 43, that magic number again, with MS, multiple sclerosis. Can you imagine that? She said she thought to herself at that point, okay, I give in. But at the same time, she decided like me, she had to do something instead. And that if she couldn't have children, she might as well become an MP and try to make the world a better place. And if you read the book, you'll read about one of the incredible things that she did. And I love that photo, actually. Can you see what it says at the back? The Human Rights Act, that's her. I also met the media on the right, the media's original icon of superwomanhood, Nicola Horlick, who was coined as the very first woman to have it all, a high-flying um, financial career and six children. It's a non de plume that she can never get away from now. But did you know that she lost her oldest child to leukemia, age 12? And I couldn't help thinking, what about that is having it all? I also met Deborah Bull on the left, the ballerina, the principal ballerina at the Royal Ballet. She's never had children. And she was really fascinating about the assumption that people make that she therefore doesn't understand the bond between a mother and a daughter. She has this brilliant riposte to people who say that to her, which is that she may not have a downwards family, but she does have an upwards family. She has been one half of the mother-child relationship, just not the other half. So don't tell her that she doesn't understand, because she kind of does. 
And next to her is Anne Daniels, the record-breaking polar explorer who had horrible fertility issues, but finally became a mum to IVF triplets and then faced huge media criticism for leaving her triplets, who she fought so hard for when they were little, to go off on long and very dangerous expeditions. I wanted to meet her because I wondered whether maybe motherhood isn't always enough. And I do think now that most people do need other things in their life as well. One of the things that meant the most to me about living and writing this story is it brought women together, whatever their motherhood story. And that is something I'm passionate about doing, both in my writing and also in my festival and campaigning. Ooh. That was a little sneak preview of the next photo. <laughs> now, I have to tell you, I'm going to cheat here. And I apologize because I know it's naughty, but I'm not actually going to tell you what the answer is to my question, does motherhood make you happy? I do come to an answer, but you'll have to read the book for that. But I am going to tell you some of the other really important things I learned. The thing that I really wasn't expecting is how many parallels there are between swimming the channel and going through IVF. They are both incredibly tough physically and mentally. But you also ultimately have to accept that however hard you try at both of them, there's something bigger than you at work. I write in the book about the channel, just like IVF, nature is ultimately in control of this challenge, not me. In the end, I can't control my body and I can't control the sea. No doctor or science can guarantee that any of us can have the chance to conceive or carry our own baby. And no amount of training will guarantee that we can cross the channel because it's very much determined by the weather, the tides, the jellyfish. I'm gonna take you back to that photo now. That I showed you a sneak preview of, there it is. I call this my jellyfish war wound photo. And this new challenge that I took on really helped me to have a conversation and come to peace with nature and the things that are out of our control that seem to govern our destiny. I also learned from all the women I met that you can definitely have a fulfilling life without children, whether or not you wanted them, but also that there are many ways to become a mother if you really want to. It's just sometimes you have to adjust the route to get there. One of my favorite conversations in the book is with a past pop sensation who wanted to remain anonymous, but became a mother aged 56, the gift of egg donation from a younger woman. And what's brilliant is it did make me think that maybe I'm wrong about the number 43. Maybe I've got until I'm 56. And actually being prepared to adjust the route is also the same with getting across the channel. Not many people will ever swim it because it is genuinely so hard. But then that's okay because there's always the Channel Tunnel, the ferry, the plane. These are much better ways of getting to France anyway. But I did swim it. And I'm gonna, there I am. <laughs> Um, and in the end, it became a bit like my own version of giving birth. But you'll have to read the book to understand why I've said that too. But by far the biggest thing I learned from this journey I went on is that everyone has sad stuff in their life. Mine is that I wasn't able to make my own biological baby with the man I love. And I won't ever get over that or stop wishing it had been different. But what I've learned is that everyone has something sad in their life. I don't know what yours is, maybe it's childlessness too. But whatever your sad thing is, you've got to do your best 
to spend this exceedingly short time we have on this planet turning it into something good for you and other people. I want to read you this other tiny chapter from my first book, Suit of Motherhood, that still rings totally true to me, even though I wrote it like five years ago. The thing is, we're all just specs, specs in an infinite universe. In a hundred years time, it won't matter who had a baby and who didn't. It doesn't now. It only matters to me because in my world, I'm enormous. So I'm trying to put things in perspective and it helps to think of myself as a speck. The important thing is to make the most of the short time I have here, to relish all the options that are possible. So I may not be a mother in the traditional sense of the word yet, but I think I am a mother in a different way. Through my writing and my festival and campaigning, I'm helping other people to create the families they dream of. So they don't have to go through what I did, but also perhaps even more importantly, I hope I'm inspiring people to live as big and as bravely as they possibly can making the most of whatever their sad thing might be in the short time we have here. So for my final slides, three years ago in 2015, I became a channel swimmer. And here I am finishing the London Marathon in 2017, which I ran for Fertility Network UK. I've now raised over £30,000 for families with children, without children, and children without families. And this is a picture of me taken just a few months ago on a mountain in Kyrgyzstan called Peak Lenin. Because I'm now on a mission, a mountain mission, that in 2020 I hope to break a world record and become the first woman to have swum the English Channel and climbed Mount Everest the two most iconic endurance journeys in the world, a feat currently only achieved by a handful of men. Not bad for a middle-aged woman who didn't know what a crampon was a couple of years ago. So to finish, I want to leave you with one final slide. The words are by the Japanese author, Kasu Ishiguro. There was another life that I might have had, but I'm having this one. And you know what? In moments, because to me, happiness is not a continuum. It's about a collection of moments. In addition to the collection of sad moments. But I am now blessed with many moments in my life that are truly happy. Thank you. Over to you, Heather. <laughs> Thank you very much for that, Jessica. Um, that was really, really interesting. Um, before we have a look to see if there are any questions, and I'm just seeing there aren't any questions down at the bottom, so if you have any questions that you would like to submit to um, Jessica, please do so now. Now, I forgot to say earlier, if you do that, could you make sure that you um, choose the anonymous function to do that? The questions won't show in the recording anyway, but it's a good idea just to keep them anonymous. Um, right, so one of the points that I wanted to make, Jessica, about that was... You talked very much about how, for you, you were so secretive for a big part of your fertility journey. You were secretive about it. Um, and I know that is something that many people in the Mortal Life community have told me that they've done too. Um, because you feel this sense of failure and you feel that you don't want people to appreciate that. But there was also something else that you said near the end when you said that to make meaning of it all, accepting that nature is in control 
is a really big step to take because through that you're actually you're making meaning that it wasn't your fault you shouldn't feel this sense of failure um, and it can take away a lot of feelings of self-loathing about what's happened to you um, and I just wondered if you had anything else you wanted to say about that really and how difficult it is to move away from being so secretive about it yeah I mean well you've said it really Heather, I mean, one of the things that always like astounds me about this, this whole subject and thing that so many of us are going through is that we all feel so many of the same feelings, you know, um, it is a phenomenon and I'm actually really, um, I'm actually sort of really quite interested in how like, you know, like we know that, you know, there are five stages of grief or whatever. We know we're grieving if we're going through those five stages or if you've got these various symptoms, you've, um, you're depressed. And I actually think that we could come up with a, a selection of things that sort of can identify you as someone who's dealing with infertility. And, you know, that sort of sense of shame and the silence that comes with that shame. I mean, I think there are a lot, as I, as I said, lots of reasons for that silence um but i think that the more of us that can go well we actually you know like we all feel this this is this this is legit a legitimate feeling um you know well and that requires more and more people to come forward and and say me too you know to to use a a very contemporary phrase you know um and then i think the more people that do that you know the, the more that we'll understand that you, you know that you are just part of something that many people are experiencing and yes it's and exactly as you say it's not your fault and um and just to go back to that thing I said about um you know at the end of the things that when I was listing the things that I feel you know I do think it is very difficult for women because you know we've only had the vote in this country for 100 years right so um we've only you know had the pill and legalized abortion in in you know some parts of this country since the 1960s we've only had that reproductive choice for like such a tiny amount of time and you know we we are living the effects of what that those things have meant and the rise in infertility and subfertility and um and you know and childlessness because of course childlessness is you know a massive part of childlessness is women not meeting you know the right partner at the right time it's it's nothing to do with medical infertility or subfertility because they don't even get the chance to try but that you know that, that the massive increase in this is to do with these other societal things that have happened that have given us emancipation and choice and you know that is something you know that we've got to work out as a race a human race you know as women and you know but we're we're just we're living we're the living guinea pigs of it and we're you know we're still trying to work that out but it's you know, it's nothing to do with an individual it's a, a movement <laughs> yeah I, I know that Jodie Day described it as like disenfranchised grief that we feel it's not really validated by anybody else and there seems to be no sort of move from society to try to understand it really so it can be very difficult and and you know and i really understand that secretiveness about it you know you you don't want to share it because you feel like no one's going to understand but actually the other thing i wanted to say to you was then then you sort of told everybody you wrote the book was it a relief yeah, I mean, I, um, it was, as I said in the presentation, it was a massive decision to, um, to do it. And, uh, but, and, you know, that it, it wasn't easy to, to come out, you know, um, at all. You know, I can't now imagine what it would be like if I hadn't come out. But what I do say is that the moment that I did, it relieved something. And I can't quite believe that I'm saying that, but I, um, if anyone has, is watching that um, hasn't 
watched Brené Brown's um, TED talk on the power of vulnerability of shame. I think it's been watched by 35 million people so far. I saw the other day. Like, I would highly recommend it because what she says is that the people who are most honest and open about the things that they feel most sad and ashamed of are the happiest people. And there is something about disclosing this thing that you, you know, that, that it eats away inside of you. The moment that you sort of give it to the world, it lessens it. And I, I don't understand the science of that, but it does. And one of the things um, that I think for me, the reasons why is that I just, I, I felt like I was, the weird thing is it was almost like I felt like I was, walking around with this sign on me saying failed woman although I wasn't like I was trying to hide it and the moment that I sort of went okay I'm a failed woman I'm an infertile I suddenly realized well yeah that's part of you but that's not all of you you're because everyone's response to that is that you know they just still see the person that they always saw you know <laughs> they and but you think all they can see is the sadness and the shame and the failure and 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 i think for that reason you know um and i i also think you know like being open about it it's you know a lot of people and i'm sure you've experienced this have a you know it's so difficult when you know friends family are getting pregnant around you their lives are moving on you know the the awkward comments that like you know the inappropriate comments and you know all that is you know it's horrible it's absolutely horrible but it's horrible on both sides you know it's horrible for you and it's horrible for the people who love you because they don't know what to do because we just don't have a language for all this stuff right so the, again if we can just talk about it we will make it easier and we will find a language for it, you know, for, for future generations. And, it, and, we, and they won't have to go through what we went through. And that's really important. You know, that's why the work that you're doing is so important too, you know, because we, I feel like we've got a duty. Other, if we just continue to be silent about it, then we're just making the same pain for the people after us. And I don't want them to go through what we went through, you know. No. And, and we're very glad that you have shared that with us because lots of people have taken comfort from reading your book and knowing that they're not alone. They haven't felt like that. And, and even some of the support services that we offer at More to Life, like Health Unlocked, um, even the e-news, you know, I always try to, to say every month to people, you know, you're not alone. Please don't feel alone. There are websites out there you can look at. You can read other people's stories that let you know that you're not going through this on your own yeah. um, and other people are feeling exactly the same feelings that you're feeling absolutely and and i don't i'm pleased don't let anyone think that i'm suggesting that everyone like has to do what i've done you know i i, I said to you earlier heather when we were doing our little rehearsal that you know like I'm not telling anyone to go and swim the channel, run the London Marathon, climb Everest, write two books, you know, come out to the world, do the Daily Mail. Like, I am clearly an extreme sort of person. I went through 11 rounds of IVF. You know, that is the extreme end of the spectrum. That is who I am. Um, but what is ha perhaps, and I hope useful in who I am, is that if by doing things in a very large way, you can make more noise and you can help people. So, like... I'm not suggesting everyone needs to go out and do what I've done, but, you know, think about who you can share what you're going through with. Think about what you could do that, you know, that, that might be, again, we talked about this earlier, didn't we, Heather, like that you could do that would be completely, it would be something that if you are struggling with infertility at the moment or you are coming you know you are thinking about a childless childless life you know think about well what could you do that you wouldn't have otherwise done that it can enrich your life because we are here for such a short amount of time and i think it's important as well that you know wait until you're ready to do that as well because sometimes you just need that little bit of reflection and healing until you feel brave enough to go and face that or to do that and and I think that's important too I don't think we can put a time scale on it I think everybody's journey is so unique that they come to that decision in their own time when they're ready 
And I wanted to say also, I know the next webinar is um, Leslie Pine um, is talking about finding joy beyond childlessness. And I think um, Leslie's book is brilliant around that um, because, you know, she looks at so many different stories of women who have come, you know, who, who've come through this in different ways. So I think, yeah. you know, this is just my way. Um, and if it resonates with some people and it can create some change in the wider world, <laughs> that's brilliant but um you know that everyone will have their own way you have to find your way i agree we've got two questions so i'm going to go down and have a look at these for us Thank you for your questions people okay so the first one is a comment i wanted to thank you very much for sharing your story you are truly an inspiration and you are proof that life is so much more than being a mother I plan to purchase both of your books and look forward to reading them. That was oh, a lovely Oh, bless you. Well, if you like them, please, can you, you can find me on my website, um, jessicahepburn.com, please, if you, if you enjoy them. I'd love to hear from you. Okay. And the other one says, did writing your book feel like fulfilling a creative urge? So did writing your book feel like you were fulfilling a creative urge? Yeah. Well, I definitely started writing it as a sort of, I think, as a cathartic process. And I think, um, you know, a, a lot of people, whether it's writing or art or singing, you know, writing music, you know, often come to... Um, creativity as a cathartic process to sort of process pain and I, it was definitely that for me but I as I said in the <coughs> presentation sorry that I am um, I did also think like there isn't I didn't feel that there was enough literature out there and I, I wanted to write so I felt I was writing something that was missing what I wasn't prepared for <coughs> and in a way this is you know, the reason for the second book is how much I discovered I loved writing. Mm. And, you know, I, I, I'm, you know, my happiest moments are me and my laptop, writing, crafting, you know, um, and that's why when I give presentations, you know, I write the presentations because um, the word has become so important to me. Um, yeah and yeah when as when I'm, i mean it is it is hard being a writer because <clears throat> at some point you have to put your your work into the world because you do want people to read it you know you want you enjoy writing it but you also want to connect with people and that is hard <clears throat> sorry everyone i've got caught i've got caught um but um but like when when i'm just writing it before it has to make its way into the world you know i feel like it could be jane austen or something <laughs> it's great <laughs> but yeah but it, um it's been a a real discovery a love yeah and i think that that's another thing as well that's important in in the making meaning of the situation as well is about finding a passion something that you enjoy something that makes you feel whole i think it's um, really important in the healing process as well yeah. Jessica, it has been absolutely wonderful having you on here there oh wait a minute we've got one more question just before we go oh it's another comment. Thank you for your time. Have taken loads away and agree that you've been such an inspiration and a joy to listen to. Oh. Amazing. You are climbing Everest too. Okay. Well, I, I didn't know. I didn't know that actually. That oh, you well, were... It's gradually getting out into the world. Um, uh, yeah. And also the thing is that if, I, 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 if I'm, if I say it, it will, you know, it, it now, if I tell the world, it will have to happen, but yes, no, it's creeping closer. So <laughs> I might as well disclose that that is what I'm aiming for. Yeah, 2020. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, I think I think we're coming to to the end of this evening. Um, a few things I'd like to say, and that is that this recording will be available <coughs> soon. It shouldn't be too long, and um, you'll find it on the usual um, website page that you go to to register for these events. Um, I will also send out a message on social media to say the recording's there. Um, the next two webinars that we have are on the same evening. Um, I'm being very brave and I'm going to try and do a double bill and that is on the hashtag Life Without Children um, Day of Fertility Week, which is on the 30th of October. So the first one will actually be Leslie Pine 
um, who um, wrote the book Finding Joy um, Beyond Childlessness. And the second one will be Sophia Gamero from um, Cardiff University. She's a senior lecturer there and she's been doing some research about um, childlessness um, and about adjusting to your unmet desire for children. So it fits in perfectly with what you've done tonight, um, Jessica. So, so that will be on as well. So they will both be on Tuesday, the 30th of October. And we'll both brilliant women who I know well. Yeah. yeah and, and, you know, yeah. we'd love as many of you as possible to come and join us for that during Fertility Week. Um, all that really remains then is for me to say thank you very much Jessica it has been an absolute pleasure really interesting talk and I know that lots of people have um, got a lot of comfort from what you've been saying wow. and also now they may have been inspired you never know we might have some more channel swimmers we might have some more people who put their name down to climb Everest who knows